بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just as a reminder for those of you that are joining us, inshallah, please scan the QR code to get access to the documents we will be using. The will has two sets of documents, a PDF and uh, an editable uh, document. So inshallah, even if you're not able to make edits right now, when you go home, you'll be able to make those edits bi Allah ta'ala. With regards to an outline for what we'll be covering tonight, uh, I'm going to share practical experience of 2023 and then we're going to move on to speaking about the importance of having a plan and what taxation may or may not look like and then last but not least we'll have uh, Faraz who is going to be joining us shortly who will be speaking about the legal aspects of it and then we'll actually do a walkthrough of the will itself so during the walkthrough of the will it'll be important that you have a copy of the will with you bi'ithnillahi ta'ala so with that being said as some of you uh, may or may not be aware, but my mother, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have mercy upon her and forgive her. I mean, she passed away in March of earlier this year, just before the month of Ramadan. And I had dealt with the passing away of my father, rahimahullah, in Quebec. So I thought it would be a very similar process. But in fact, it was very, very different. So there's a couple of things I want to highlight and to explain, bi ta'ala. Prior to my mother's passing, we were fortunate enough, alhamdulillah, to have an educational, I guess, insight where we created three documents for her. Number one was her power of attorney. Number two was her personal directive. And then number three was the Islamic will itself. With regards to the personal directive, this will take care of any medical decisions that need to be made if she is not able to do them herself. So for example, if psychologically she's unable to decipher and make decision, or she's in a coma, then in that sort of situation, I would be able to make those decisions for her. Oftentimes, people think you just get the document and you're said and done, but it's not that simple. As a part of this document, you want to ask the person, you know, if you're in a, in a comatative state, do you want to be resuscitated if you happen to pass away or not? What is the Islamic ruling on that? How long do you want to prolong being in that state? So those sort of sensitive questions you want to have with the individual at hand as well as get the Islamic ruling on those scenarios. Number two is the power of attorney. The power of attorney is to deal with any financial decisions that need to be made while the person is still alive. So this can be dealing with bank accounts, paying of bills, investing accounts, and even buying and selling of real estate. But this is only while the person is still alive. And then last but not least, it is the Islamic will. And this is what you deal with after a person passes away. All of their wishes for after their passing are documented in the will. And that is what we will be spending quite a bit of time discussing inshallah ta'ala. So with that being said, let me catch you up to the day that she passed away. Rahimahullah. I get to the hospital with her. She's uh, extremely ill at this point, and he didn't care that I was directly related to her or that I was you know, responsible for her for the past four years. What they cared about was my name on the personal directive. And as long as my name was on the personal directive, they were willing to engage with me and speak with me, but if it wasn't, they would not speak to me or engage with me. And this shows you the value of that document. She passed away shortly thereafter. I would say within 20 minutes to half an hour of us arriving to the hospital, she passed away at that time. And then from that point on, they had to create uh, a death certificate, which is very, very important that you get that piece of paper that at least in the preliminary stages, if you need to do any work, that preliminary paper will allow you to do any work. And then a couple of days later, after the, the burial has taken place, 
you can actually apply for the death certificate and that is what you'll need to do all of the legal work, to do all of the financial work. Everyone will ask for a copy of that death certificate. So make sure you get that processed as soon as possible. For the actual janazah itself, Alhamdulillah, being engaged in the community, I knew what to do. And it basically came down to contacting one of two people, either Zuhair Usman or Najah al Hajj. And you want to make sure that you have some sort of communication with them, whoever you decide to take care of your funeral experience, as you will be talking about, has some sort of contact with them. Because they are the ones that will coordinate the pickup from the hospital to the masjid, where the body will be washed, to where the janazah will be prayed, coordinating the janazah, the timing of it, and then the transportation to the cemetery, and the transportation to the cemetery. The Muslim cemetery for us is actually not in Calgary, it's in Cochrane. It's in Cochrane, so it's quite a distance away. The expense uh, cost for the funeral uh, in March was just a, a little bit around $6,000. So Alhamdulillah, I can't remember the exact number, but it was around the 6,000 figure mark, approximately 6,500. So that's how much you can anticipate and more as things are getting more expensive, bithnillahi ta'ala. So then the janazah takes place, everything is done, Alhamdulillah, and I'll highlight this. It is imperative, and I use this term not from a religious sense that it's fard or wajib, but from a cultural, social perspective, it is imperative that you teach how your children to lead a janazah. Because we want the individual that is closest to the deceased to lead the janazah. The most sincere dua, the more prolonged the dua, the more effective the dua for the closest relative. And alhamdulillah, it is from the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I was able to lead the janazah of my mother and my father. And I'm hoping for the brothers that are here in this room, you learn how to do it, develop the confidence so that inshallah when your parents and when your close relatives pass away, you have the ability to do that as well. The Imams will always be there, but take this initiative upon yourself to learn how to do that as well. So after the janazah takes place, everything is settled and done. Now I have to deal with the legal side of her assets, which Alhamdulillah, she had a condominium. We had to sell that condominium. I spoke to a real estate agent. The real estate agent said that you will need uh, to get probate done first to show that you are actually capable of selling this house. So probate means you have to submit your will to the court and then the court, you can come up inshallah, the seat's for you. You will have to submit your will to the court and then they will go through the will, verify the will, make sure everything is in order and then they will give you permission to sell the assets at that time. In order to do this, you will need a lawyer, and this is the very lawyer that I used, Faraz Bawa, and we'll, giving, we'll be sharing his uh, contact information at the end, inshallah. So we got the probate around uh, the month, uh, the end of May, around the end of May. So imagine from March 15th is the death, probate took place at the end of May. So only after the end of May was I able to contact a real estate agent to get the property sold. Now, during that time, it's just a waiting game, which means any expenses that need to be paid on the real estate property, like gas, like electricity, if there are condo fees, you have to keep paying that. You have to keep paying that. As the executor, you want to keep track of all of the expenses that you are paying so that they are actually deducted from the estate at the end. Alhamdulillah, eventually the property gets sold and this is where I was clueless. I didn't know what to do. But I showed up at the bank, I'm like, hey, here's the check. Can I have this amount transferred to my account so that I can share the wealth with my sister? The bank said, sorry, we cannot do that. You have to create an account for the estate. And no one told me that, subhanAllah. So make sure that you create an account for the estate through which the check will go into that account. And then from that account, you have to make an accounting list of all of the expenses and how this money is going to be distributed. And then once the bank approves of that, the executor of the will can withdraw that money and give it to the inheritors. Give it to the inheritors. So from the end of May, all the way till July, that's how long it took. That's how long it took. 
So this is a practical experience of what happened to me in 2023. So make sure you take note of that practical experience and make sure you have all of those things that you will need. That power of attorney, the personal directive. And today, alhamdulillah, we'll be covering the Islamic will. For those of you that are just joining us, please make sure you scan the QR code and have that ready to go. With that being said, we're not going to be speaking about the financial planning side, and I'm going to be handing it over to my good friend, Hash, inshallah. Hash, put this on. I need that. I need that. I feel like a celebrity here. Bear with me. How is it now? Higher? No, I didn't put it in the middle on your shirt. Oh, middle of my shirt. Yeah. Oh, man. There you go. How's that? Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think you may actually have to speak down as well. Yeah. yeah. Keep moving it up. I'll just move it up over here. Crank the volume? Okay, perfect. I don't have the voice. I'm always behind the screen on, <laughs> on my own microphone that's cranked up, so this is a little bit different. Um, uh, anyways, so um, many of you might have might know me. Uh, my, many of you are actually uh, friends and clients in this audience here. And uh, uh, my name is Hashmutullah Assad. I'm an executive financial consultant, uh, as well as a division director with IG Wealth Management. Uh, I've been in this role uh, with this company for about 18 years now. Alhamdulillah, um, started very very young. And um, I have certain designations, one of them is a CFP. A CFP stands for Certified Financial Planner. Uh, and that's the PN of my industry for what I do. Uh, with an IG Wealth Management, there's a lot of advisors across Canada that do different things, but the select few of us will qualify to be on the securities platforms, which means we have the capacity to give you advice, not only like funds, but also stocks and ETF and SMAs and things like that. Uh, and we're fully licensed in different provinces, I can see on the screen here. The reason I'm here is, um, I want to I want to tell you what happens when he passed away. Subhanallah. Um, when when a when a husband passes away, I'm going to pick the guy first because we we tend to die first. Uh, when a husband passes away, everything that he owns, um, whatever kind of wealth that he owns, uh, will go to the spouse, the living uh, spouse um, or the wife, tax free. There's no problems, no issues. And when if the uh, the wife passes away, everything that she owns will go to the husband tax free. No problems, no issues. Right. Upon the passing of the last person, upon the last, when the last person passes away, you can expect to lose somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of your wealth to Revenue Canada before you your children so get it. You can't hear me? Can hear okay. Uh, I think they're going to give you the handheld mic. Okay, perfect. Okay. Is that better? Should be. Oh, 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 that's much better. Wow. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. What is happening? Bismillah. I need to. <laughs> All right, let me, let me repeat that again. When, when, a, when a husband passes away, everything that he owns will go to the wife tax free. No problem, no issues. And when the wife passes away, everything that she owns will go to the husband tax free. No problem, no issues. Upon the passing of the last person, depending on what kind of wealth that is remaining, Expect to lose somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of it to Revenue Canada before your children get it. Your children, your parents, your sisters, your brothers are not your first beneficiary. Revenue Canada is, right? So we are talking about at this point the will. And I'm going to try to use an analogy of where we are uh, on this journey, right? The journey, if I, if I to help you visualize it, let's just say we're all in Calgary right now, and we are trying to travel to Toronto, and that's our destination. Um, we know this is a very big country. It's a lot of distance to cover, right? And we know that to travel this distance, we can't walk, right? And therefore, you know, we need to create a vehicle. The question is, what kind of vehicle, right? What kind of engine, what type, what kind of tires, uh, windshield, 
how many seats are going to be in this vehicle, who else is traveling with you, and where are you going to be making your stops. And the analogy of this, this journey is life essentially. Right? And we know for a fact, none of us here today will be able to travel in a straight line from here to Toronto without directions. Right? And life is just like that. Majority of us travel through life 5, 10, 15, 20, 40 years without any type of planning. Right? Majority of the people that I deal with, and subhanAllah we just had a case yesterday, they seek me out much later in life. They usually come to me when they're in their mid-50s, 60s, 70s. A couple of reasons they, they seek me out because they're looking for advice. And number two, that's where the wealth is, so I'm kind of hanging out in that part of the world in terms of age. And number three, they have a major problem. Because for 20, 30, 40 years of their life, they've been creating this problem and now they have to face it, which means looking to lose 400, 500, 600, 800, 1.2, $3 million in terms of taxes to Revenue Canada. Money not going to their children. And what Sheikh Naveed is referring to is if this is the, the journey that we try and travel from Calgary to Toronto, we are talking today about you getting to Toronto, living there for a while, dying, and then leaving a set of instructions on what happens to your vehicle. Today we're just talking about that set of instructions, which is you will. But not a lot of time and effort and energy is being spent about this travel plan. Where are the stops? What happens with the children? When are they gonna get off? When are you gonna go for Hajj and Umrah? How are you gonna buy your home? And all these different planning. If you think about the fact that, you know, sometimes you have individuals with 800 or 900 or million dollars in terms of investments, it's a big number, um, and, and they, they come to us and say, hey, listen, I've been, I've been working for 40 years of my life and I have this million dollars, now I'm ready to retire. I can tell you right now that 95% of the time, it doesn't work. For 95% of the people, they can't have what they want. And it's all because for the lack of planning, right? They never sat down and figure out what that journey and destinations are gonna look like. Are they doing proper planning, right? So when we talk about proper planning, we're looking at things differently, right? You have to look at things such as your retirement. It is good that we all work in and we're gonna be able to accumulate some wealth over time. The question is, is it optimized? What kind of wealth do you have? Is it gonna be sufficient? And I can tell you, 95% of the time, it's not sufficient. You think you can have it, but you can't. And it's because we miss simple things like inflation. Somebody today will tell me, Hash, if you give me $3,000 a month for the rest of my life, I will live like a king. I have no problems with that. But you have to remember the fact that if you retire at 60, you're expected to live to be 90. You know, we may say we're all going to die at 70. No, you're not going to die at 70. You live in Canada, alhamdulillah, things are different here. So if you're going to retire at 60, die at 90, that is 30 years of $3,000 a month coming in. But the problem is not even that. The problem is $3,000 a month in 2023 is a very different number than $3,000 a month in 2040. Those are not the same thing. Right? So what we're referring to here is inflation. Right? That is a silent killer. You have no idea how much resources are needed to be able to keep up with inflation. I remember for a fact, and I'll be mindful of time here, when we first came to Canada, this is going back about 20 years ago now, um, somehow I was in charge of groceries, I don't know why, I haven't done it since then, uh, but I was in charge of groceries. So I had to go to the superstore and buy groceries for the full, for full family. And it was like $50, like $75 whole week done, alhamdulillah. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? 2000s, 2001, 2003, in that area. 50, 60 bucks, everybody spent for the whole week. Now try doing that. Like I think bread is like $20 nowadays. I don't know what's going on with it. But, but so, so that's one thing. So you can't, you gotta properly. The second thing is we're talking about sharing your estate. 
if you plant properly, you do not need to lose 30, 40, 50% of your wealth to Revenue Canada. You can plan around it. You just have to be careful what kind of wealth you accumulate, how you spend it, and how does it get passed on to your next generation. Managing cash flow is very, very important, subhanAllah. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, our, uh, our people are very mindful of cash flow, but sometimes we're not, right? So if I ask a person to give me how much money they're making, so we look at the pay stubs, we know how much money you're making, how much money's been deposited into your bank account, and we usually ask them how much money they're spending, like we get the spending. And usually, it's between 20 to one person was $110,000. So we can find 20 grand a year just being spent on random things. That's sort of the average. But there was one individual who could not account for $100,000 a year of missed, missing income. I, I couldn't find it. It's just been spent somewhere, right? So there's a lot of leakage in our cash flow. Preparing for unexpected is very important. And then of course, planning your major expenditures. The biggest dream, the biggest goal most of us have in this room is to buy our home. The question is, how do we buy our home the halal way? And we've done webinars and, and things on that. So having that planned out, how do I go from 2023 to 20, I don't know, pick a number, 2030, and being positioned to pay cash for my house? You can do it, it's not impossible. And of course, you own a business, we can maximize the business asset as well. So the reason I'm here is I want to make sure that you plan out the journey. Right? We're talking about you're getting to your destination, you're passing away, and trying to figure out what happens with the vehicle, but you have to create that vehicle. Nobody has it. I yet to run into a person in 18 years of my career who actually has a financial plan. It hasn't happened. I don't know. Maybe one day I'll do that. Nobody has it. We just do random things. And hoping that one day we show up at the gates of heaven at age 60, and then we've been trying to build this dream home, and it's not what we wanted, right? So we have to do the due diligence and from that perspective. How am I doing for time share? Probably like another 10, 15 minutes. Oh, it's lots, yeah, I'm almost done. Alhamdulillah. So what exactly what am, I, what, am I, what am I talking about? So financial planning is a step-by-step -step process for achieving one's life's goal. A financial plan serves as a roadmap, right? You need to be very, very specific. What do I need to do? When do I need to do it? And you need to use science and math and AI to be able to create these plans, right? You can't just be a spreadsheet of me saving $500 a month and go from there. One thing I often get, um, I ask people how much you're saving, right? A lot of us save on a regular basis. I ask them how much you're saving and I get a number like I'm saving 10% or 15% or 20%. And I always ask the question, how did you come up with this number? Like why is it, why is it 10%? Who told you it's 10%? What data point are you using to come up with this number, right? Why isn't it, like my number is 35%. Like that's how much I save but I know my plan. I know what I need to do, when I need to do it specifically. So inshallah, I'll go from there. Now life changes. We know that. And this is why it's called a living plan because what you assume in 2023 might not be accurate in 2040 or 2030 or 2025 even, right? So life changes, so therefore you have to be accommodated to that. But that's what it's referring to. So essentially what it does, and it looks at your income, looks at your expenses and your investments and figures out how do you plan that journey from Calgary to Toronto and do you have the proper vehicle to carry everybody else that's, that's that are traveling with you? Um, a couple more slides from me and then I'm done, Shalala. So the way we do it, the way it's done with us, is we try to figure out where you are financially, right? What is your goals? What are your dreams? What stops do you need to make? How old are children? When are they gonna go to school? Is there enough money for them? Do you buy your house? How much are you saving at work? How much are you saving outside of work? Um, and specifically, when, what do you want when you want it? Are you going for Hajj? Are you going for Umrah? Are you buying a car and how are we going to fund that? Then we try to figure out where you are financially. What do you own? What do you owe? What are you making? What are you spending? Those are two data points. So we know where, the, where you are and where your destination is. We help you develop an, an actual physical plan. Like it's it's a, done by a computer software that does that for us. But once you build a plan, you got to implement it. And the key point that most people miss, so people are able to kind of figure out where they are, what they want, they're able to design some sort of plan, but, and they're able to implement it as well. But what gets missed is you gotta go back. You gotta back, go back and adjust it. Adjust it with the times and what's happening, proactively adjusting it is very, very important as well. And then, um, um, in terms of the, the, the debt and taxation, things like that, 
uh, subhanAllah, you know, you, you may not have a lot of wealth left behind, so maybe you're not going to lose that much of your net worth. But our job is to make sure you have a lot of wealth and then you pass it down to the next generation in the most tax efficient way possible. There are things that you can do way ahead of time. It's just usually it comes much later. And by that time when I get involved, it's just too late. There's not much I can do because you've been creating a problem for 30 or 40 years of your life. And it's very, very hard to unwrap those tax issues. Okay. Probate fee is not a big deal. It's actually non-existent here in Alberta. But many provinces, based on how much money you're leaving behind, they will take a cut, as a one and a half percent of your of your estate. So there are people in Toronto paying 15, 30, uh, 60 grand just to the provincial government because they have probate, right? Um, and then um, and then doing a proper estate analysis. You can figure that out. It's very easy to figure out how much money you're going to leave behind, and how much that's going to get taxed, and what your tax bill is going to be in the future. So that, that's it for me, from my side. Um, in the website that we just linked here, on the QR code is here as well, we have included the actual will kit from ISC. You have the PDF and the Word document. But with it, there's a whole bunch of other documents that you can download that are free of charge. We call it a state planning guide, you know, um, the thing to call the things to know about probate fee, again, not applicable in Alberta, but ask can correct me. Um, and if you have somebody else with disability and leaving an inheritance to, to them and how you do it properly. So there's a lot of information on this. One advice that I'll give you from my side is just start planning. Figure out where you are, what you want, when you want it, and how you're going to get there. And, uh, and, and start with that, inshallah. Zakhmukhan. Okay. Inshallah. Zakhmukhan. I forgot to introduce Faraz. Oh, yes. Sorry. Bismillah. Okay. Faraz, do you want to introduce? <laughs> Okay, alhamdulillah, we have Faraz with us. Um, he, um, m me and Faraz have worked together, alhamdulillah, for with many webinars. Um, he is a, um, uh, he works with uh, Stuart Sharma Harsani here in downtown Calgary, and he was called to the bar in 2014. Uh, Faraz has experienced in appearing before all levels of the court, in including the Immigration and Refugee Board, the Federal Court of Canada, and regularly attends provincial courts and the King's Bench to deal with family law matters now. Alhamdulillah, it's now the King's Bench. Um, uh, so Alhamdulillah, Faraz is actually very active in the community. I often see him in the Northwest of Salah, um, and, uh, and he is uh, a gem to work with and a very, very generous person in terms of his, his time. Every time we have asked him to help us out with these webinars and seminars, he's always available. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Faraz, and he's going to take you through what there's a will and a bunch of other things like that. Oh, yeah. So I just clip this on somewhere. That's good. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect. Salaam alaikum, everybody. Thank you. Oh, that's a lot of work. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. Uh, thank you, Sheikh Naveed and Hash for having me out again to help share some thoughts and information to the community. So Hash was mentioning the importance of a will. So in essence, what a will does is it gives you, it give, allows you to give instructions about how you want your assets to be managed after you're gone. Because at this point, you're no longer able to give instructions on that issue. Now, this can be, it can be complex at times when there's tax planning issues, which is why it's really important uh, to contact or have an accountant, have a financial advisor, have, some, have people that have helped plan for when this uh, inevitability will arise for each of us. So that way you're dealing with things in as tax efficient manner as possible. Uh, the, the, now, I'll briefly note a brief correction on the slide. It says uh, it's read by provincial court, but it's actually King's Bench uh, in surrogate court that would deal with the will. Uh, most, I would say a fair amount of wills will have to go through court to get probate. Uh, it's, I would say very few wills where there's no real assets to transfer over or titles to switch that uh, that wouldn't need probate. So it is important to have a will ready. And that's something where 
you would discuss with your accountant, with your financial planner, what your assets are, how you'd like them dealt with, and then you'd also speak to your mom about what you plan to do with your with your estate and how you want to divide it, what the Sharia, Sharia says about which which person you leave behind gets how much, if you choose to leave a discretionary portion behind to a charitable cause or the community. So these are all things to think about beforehand because as we'll touch after, if you pass away without a will, you have essentially, you have very little control in the matter. So there are two other documents that often go with a will. One is called the personal directive. One is called the power of attorney. A personal directive is more about the human element. I mean, it'll go into things about what your healthcare needs would be, who you can associate with, sort of more of a, almost like a parental sort of role uh, that someone would have over you. And this would be while you are still alive, but you lack the capacity to make decisions or do anything for yourself as an adult. So that could be because you're unconscious, that could be because you've lost uh, capacity for some kind of mental health issue. But for any reason, if you're not able to make decisions for yourself or look after yourself, you can create a personal directive. The personal directive will then give instructions. Well, at first it'll appoint somebody to make these decisions for you. And then you can give instructions to that person in that personal directive as well about how you would like things to be managed, how you'd like things like end of, li uh, end, end of life care to be managed. So a personal directive is a common thing that people do when they do their will. And the other one is a power of attorney. So this is similar to a personal directive, but this is really transactional. So this would be for more things like taxes, for banking, uh, business dealings, managing investments. So that this is much more transactional versus more of a social and medical thing, which would be your personal directive. So those are two things that people typically do when they make their will. These two documents are functional while you're alive, but uh, lack capacity. And then they become ineffective, they're, they're nullified when you pass and then everything goes to what your will says. And if you don't do these, th I mean, you know, we, we'll discuss what happens if you don't have a will, but also if you don't have a personal directive or a power of attorney, uh, then your family members and, and yourself, really, you could be in a bit of trouble about how your assets, how your day-to-day -day decisions will be managed. And then your family member who would be trying to take care of you would have to make an application to court for an adult guardianship uh, and trusteeship uh, application order, sorry, over you. That'll take time. They'll need a capacity assessment report to do this. The, doing one of these things is really simple and it, it saves yourself and your family a lot of trouble. So we always recommend everybody take the step, talk to somebody, get this made, whether you do it on your own with a lawyer, just it's something to discuss and plan for. So what happens now if you die without a will in Canada? So if you die without a will in Canada, you're what they call intestate, which means at this point, we don't have instructions from you about what you would like to do with your assets, how you would want your affairs managed, how you plan to leave things for your family members. So with this, you don't get the benefit of planning for tax ramifications. You don't get the benefit of managing who, uh, sorry, if you want to leave any money to uh, the community, to a mosque. It, it really just it leaves a lot of ambiguity and it also takes away, for the most part, any control that you would otherwise have. It gets left for your family members to deal with after a court will divide things or sometimes not even divide, just give things to the person in an order of succession that the law has, right? So there's a, there's a slide here which goes through what would happen if you die without a will. Uh, now generally what will happen is if you have no children and you have a spouse or what they call an adult interdependent partner, then everything goes to them. 
the general order of preference, we'll call it, or succession is spouse, then children, and then if there's no children and those children don't have children, then we get to parents, and then from there we will go grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles. Uh, it'll, it'll spread out. But the reason why this is important to consider, uh, and Sheikh Naveed can comment more on this than I, is Sharia, uh, the Sharia will say that you have to give certain percentages to certain family members based on your family composition. So that's why it's important to plan for this in advance. So now a will is something that you'll make, but there are instances where you'll want to change it. So that can be if someone that's listed in your will is no longer with us. When you appoint someone to look after your will, they're called the personal representative. They used to be called the executor, it's the same term effectively. But they are the ones that look after what you're doing. The de uh, death of a trustee, so again, that's somebody that will help manage the estate for you, the birth of a child, marriage, birth of a grandchild, uh, divorce, any, anything where your family composition is changing, that's something for Sharia will especially that becomes relevant because when there's a, fa a change in family members, there'd be a change in percentages perhaps. Right? Mo depending on the family members which change, there'd definitely be a, a change in the percentages or if things change for you financially or you list a certain asset that you want distributed a certain way and you don't have that asset anymore or the value in it's changed significantly and the percentages get thrown off so there's a number of different times where you'll want to come back in make changes and if you have an existing will you'll likely not it won't be that complicated to then make that change the other thing to think about is when you've made your will, you'll name someone as your personal representative or what used to be called an executor. So this person is the person you are leaving behind to make decisions and run your estate for you and look after it. So it is important to think about who you want to appoint to, to take care of these things for you. I think it's important to think about be here to manage things with your estate. If there's a challenge to the estate, that may be an issue. If that person's able to get a visa to enter Canada, that may be an issue. So there's a number of reasons to think about who you're appointing to look after things for you, and perhaps overseas is not always the best option. Uh, somebody that has the appropriate age and health to manage things as well. So choosing, I suppose, if you're, you're elderly and your spouse is very elderly, you may want to think about the burden you're putting on them to go and sign court forms and documents and file things. There are other options that are usually available. There are companies that will help you uh, do this for, help do this for you, sorry. So again, there's thought that should be given for how you're appointing uh, a personal representative for your will. And the last bit I'll briefly comment on is whether or not that there's a conflict between what a Sharia will, will provide for and what Canadian law will see as appropriate. So there are instances where you can imagine that there could be problems. One of them is that if you have, for example, a wife and children, your wife gets one eighth, which is 12 and a half percent. That on some level can become problematic if the wife is not left with adequate support uh, and assets to look after herself if that will gets challenged although courts will generally honor your wishes they will want to make sure that your dependents are looked after properly so that would basically be your spouse and children if uh, if they're under 18 uh, or if they're able to, uh, if they're still in school or unable to withdraw from parents care then they can be older and then it you know, you'd look at the circumstances, but at that point, generally, when they're 22. So there can be issues where cho uh, the, what you're leaving behind may not be entirely consistent with what Canadian law may say. Another issue that could arise is daughters will get half of what sons will get. Uh, if there's minors involved, then there could be a situation where the Office of Public Guardian and Trustee, who will investigate what's happening for minors may say well we think this is a problem so there are some thoughts to be given about how you're structuring your assets and 
how you're structuring your will afterwards and which way, how you want to manage that with your family and how you want to try and plan for potential conflicts or problems between what you're leaving behind as a Sharia instruction and what possible issues could arise when you're dealing with it in court. So those are, those are my thoughts, at least for now, and I'll pass it now to Sheikh Navid. Thank you so much. Okay, folks, just again, if you haven't downloaded the document, please download it and have it in front of you uh, because we're about to go through it, inshallah. Like, what is the ruling on having a will? Historically, the scholars have said that it is a highly recommended sunnah to have a will based upon such a hadith and the ayah uh, in the Quran. But from a practical level, when we look at uh, the ahkam of the sharia, they're void of context. But when you look at fatwa, fatwa takes concept, context into consideration. So on the level of a hukum, yes, it's sunnah mu'akkad and we can't really change that and we're not going to argue that. But from practical experience, having dealt with people that have passed away and my own personal experiences, I'm more inclined to say that it is wajib to have a will in a place like Canada just so that the, 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 the distribution of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires from us can take place. So now, what actually happens when you pass away? From an Islamic perspective, four things are meant to happen. Your burial, funeral, janazah expenses are all meant to be deducted first. So we've already approximated that 2023, it's about six and a half thousand dollars, and it's only going to get more expensive as time goes on. If you're ever afforded the opportunity to purchase your plot of land in advance, I actually think that would be a good idea to save yourself money at that time. So if you're able to purchase your plot of land where you will be buried, take advantage of that. So that is the first thing. The second thing that will happen, my dear friend, please don't walk in front of the camera next time. Okay, don't walk in front of the camera. The second thing to keep in mind is that all of your debts will be paid off. Meaning that if you have any debts that are there, they should be paid off at that time. And we've spoken about in the, in the previous weeks on how debt is discouraged unless you need to be in debt. And if you have the ability to pay the debt off quickly, do so and do not prolong it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he intentionally did not pay the janazah of certain individuals that had a debt and were able to pay it off. So make sure you, don't, you are not in that situation. Number three, the third thing that will happen is your wasiyah will be fulfilled. And we'll speak about that in detail as we come to that section. That is your charitable contribution and your giving of gifts to people that are not naturally inheriting from you. And then last but not least, the mirath or the distribution of the inheritance will take place. Now at the end of the will document, there's an appendix that starts on page number nine. Those are all the possible common scenarios that uh, exist. And that is what should be implemented bi ta'ala. So now, with that being said, let us start with the actual document itself. So the document starts off with I, and that is where you're meant to put your name, put your full entire name as per your legal uh, identification. Your driver's license, your passport, whatever name is on those documents, that is the name you want to put over here, bi ta'ala, residing at your current address, wherever you currently live. Over here it says city of Calgary, province of Alberta, if you happen to move, make sure you get that updated. That's why the document is there for you to make those edits. And for those of you that are tuning in online uh, across Canada and North America, make sure to make that edit as well. And then this is the big thing that I will always tell you. Yes, this is an effort from the Muslim community to make things easy, but it is a starting point. It is not the end point. Everyone has a different financial situation, family situation, individual circumstance. So always make sure you do your due diligence of seeking legal counsel and a proper financial and tax advisor to deal with your situation. Never think that this document is going to solve all of your problems. This is just a starting point for the conversation. So that is page number one. At the bottom of page number one, you will see a portion for signatures. That is where your signature will take place. And at the end of the document, you will see that we ask that there's three witnesses. We would encourage that also the three witnesses sign each page. On the next page, you will have funeral and burial rites. 
So part A, this is where you hereby uh, nominate and appoint two individuals, their names and their addresses. Always seek their permission and consent first. Make sure you tell them in advance, hey, is it okay if I appoint you as the person to take care of my funeral and burial rights? Why is this important? Because if you don't appoint someone, no one may know what to do at that time. Number two, the reality is that there's a level of ignorance that still exists. So sometimes a person doesn't know where the Muslim cemetery is, so they get them buried at any cemetery. The individual doesn't know that you have to perform the ghusl and the janazah, so they take it straight from the hospital to a funeral home and from the funeral home to the cemetery, right? So you want to make sure that you talk to someone that actually knows what they're doing. They know who to contact. They know that the, the, which masjid to, to get the body delivered to and all those nuanced situations. So have that conversation with someone and make sure they're on the same page as you. So it gives you the opportunity to nominate two people in case one is not available, then signatures at the bottom. So just keep that in mind. Every page will require a signature and I'm not going to keep mentioning it uh, for the rest. Your signature and your witnesses. Then we have the executor of the will. So now, actually page five is over. Hmm, I'm missing page five. Yeah, all of this didn't get printed out properly, subhanAllah. No, I got it. Yeah. There we go, page five. So that is uh, the bottom of page five, you see the executor and guardian. This is where you will be uh, appointing your executor and guardian, bi ta'ala. Let me see if we can find page four now. I thought this would have been in order. Do you have page four there? We're missing page four. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay. Bismillah. My apologies uh, for that. So page four will have your uh, funeral and burial rights. Page five is the executor and guardian. And this is where you actually uh, point the executor and guardian on page six. So again, it will give you space for two individuals in case one is not available. The executor and guardian. We've gone through some of the criterion over here, but here are uh, another couple of things to keep in mind. The importance of this person having time to do so. I cannot emphasize the amount of time that it will take having to meet with lawyers, having to meet with the financial planners, having to meet with the accountant for taxation, having to meet with the real estate agent, and having to do all of these small tasks that need to be done. So this is person is someone that should have time to do so. Number two, this person should be trustworthy. Literally, they will have all of the power. And if this person is not trustworthy, then things can take place that we don't want to take place. Number three, make sure that this person actually has a desire to help. Now, Islamically, you are allowed to pay the executor if you want, to, want them to you know, be compensated for their time. That's a choice that you can make. But make sure that this person is willing to do so as well. So some people may be appointed, they think it's an easy task. As soon as they see how much is involved, they step back, then everything remains in limbo. And you see certain cases that will drag on for years and people aren't getting their inheritance because the executor is taking their sweet time. The executor is someone that should know that this is an amana that is on their shoulders and on their necks that they have to fulfill with their due diligence in a timely as manner as possible ta'ala. Debts and expenses. It is, we'll do questions at the end. I don't have it unfortunately on the computer. My apologies, I don't have it on the computer. But if you just follow along in the document, I'm giving the page numbers on top. For the debts and expenses along with the assets, it's not a requirement to include it, but I would highly, highly emphasize that you do. Create a page of all of your assets, where they're located, who has access to them, how do you have access to them, right? You have properties overseas, make a document of it. You have bank accounts overseas, make a document of it. Even in Canada, you have multiple investment accounts, multiple bank accounts, you have businesses, document all of that. Who are the people that you have been dealing with that have access to those accounts and then can help out in that situation? Then secondly is the debts and expenses. So all of the debts that you have, who are those debts to? When are they due? What amount for? What is their contact information? 
make the life of the executor and your family members easier by having all of this stuff ready to go bi ta'ala now we get to page number eight and this is the wasiyah component that i was talking about the hadith of sa'ad ibn abi waqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu where sa'ad wanted to give some of his inheritance to his family members specifically and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam kept on going back and forth with him Till he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said thuluthu wa thuluthu kathir, That even one third That give, you can give up to one third But even one third is a lot So what that means is People that are inheriting from you They cannot be included in the wasiyah People that are not eligible to inherit from you They can be included in the wasiyah You have a neighbor that you love A friend that you love You know someone in the community that you dearly love You want to give them a gift after you pass away this is where you include it. You want to give some sort of sadaqah, you want to do some sort of you know, charity uh, legacy project, you can give it from over here. But what I will point out over here are two things. The sadaqah that you give while you are alive is much, much superior than the sadaqah that you give after you pass away. Number two is that in the hadith of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, the Prophet makes it very clear that it is better for you to leave your family financially affluent, not having to beg, not having to, you know, work hard to resolve their financial circumstance is better than for you to give sadaqah and gifts. So if you're at that level, alhamdulillah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with a lot of money, then by all means, give sadaqah and do all of those things. Your, fina- your family, inshallah, will be taken care of. But if you're not at that level, give priority to your family above all else. You want to give sadaqah, give sadaqah while you are alive. So it has the names, uh, a place for the names and the organizations, the percentage amounts, the total should not come out to more than 33% and you write out the word percentage as well. Then we move on to uh, page number 10 and 11 and this is where you will put the date and the year. So you sign it off for the day that you complete it. Bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. And then you get to page number 12. Page number 12, you will have your legal name. If you are a convert to Islam, you put your Muslim name as well. Then you have space for three witnesses. Three witnesses and their addresses. We highly encourage the witnesses to be Muslim, male, adult, sane, trustworthy witnesses. That is what we encourage people to do so. If you're unable to find three, then you're able to do one male and two females as well bi ta'ala that is also permissible over here then you put the number of pages so if you've included a list of your assets a list of your liabilities include those pages there as well then also put who is getting a copy of your will so i would suggest leave one with your family where they can keep it safe leave one with um, the, the bank so they have access to all of your, your stuff and how it should be dealt with and then leave one with the executor as well and you can make more copies of this and share it with other people there's no problem but I would say at least those three to be on the safe side those three to be on the safe side and then you can also get it notarized you can also get it notarized is it a requirement to get it notarized? no it's not you get it notarized it will be better and again I will emphasize always do your own de- due diligence and seek legal counsel and advice. Then starting from page 13 all the way till the end, you have all the different scenarios of how your wealth will be distributed amongst the heirs. Um, On the very last page, there's this note about all other cases. As we know, things are drastically changing in our day and age in terms of people's level of practice of religion and what that entails if they're still Muslim or not even with regards to gender and how they identify and things like that, all of those things will need to be taken into consideration from a Canadian legal perspective, right? So now in that sort of situation, what you find in here may not accommodate to that, but there's a space to say that, you know, if there's a scenario that has not been documented over here, please reach out to a particular imam or a particular organization that can give you a fatwa what to do in that situation for all other cases ta'ala. So that is just a quick run through of this document. Now, we, it is currently 8.28. Insha'Allah, I'm hoping that we can stop at 
uh, to have the Adhan and the Iqamah right after, right? So initially Adhan is supposed to be at 8.37, Iqamah at 8.47. We're going to push the Iqamah three minutes just to accommodate everyone's questions. Bidnillahi ta'ala. We have a couple of things to be uh, cognizant of when you are making your will, whether you use this template or you use something else, make sure it's not something that's too simplified or something that's too confusing. Again, if you consult a lawyer, they will help you go through that. In most cases, as long as your will is not being challenged, you should be okay. But if the will does get challenged, that is particularly where it is best if you have legal advice in advance. So if you're anticipating that your family members or your friends are going to challenge your will, make sure that you have that legal advice in advance because that is going to be the, the, the case where you will need legal advice the most. But if you feel that, you know what, your family is going to accept your wishes and there isn't anything going to be contested, then even the simple will, something like this, as long as it's witnessed and it can be proven that it is yours, for the most part, it will stand. But any legal questions, we're going to direct towards Faraz as well. This is Faraz's information over here. Local to Calgary, easily accessible. You can contact him for any personal questions that you may have in case he's not able to answer them here. Also keep in mind sensitivity that not everything should be answered uh, in public as well. Bithnallahi ta'ala. With that being said, we will now open up the floor for questions for the next uh, 20 minutes, inshallah. Anyone that has a question, just raise your hand, inshallah. Bismillah. The forms for the personal directive and the power of attorney. For the personal directive, there is a template available on Alberta Health Services. And then for the power of attorney, are there any templates available? Uh, there's probably something out there. Yeah. But, um, I mean, if you were to go and get one done with a lawyer, just a power of attorney, they're very quick. They're, they're really cheap. Yeah. I wouldn't. That, that's what I would suggest as well. So you may have free templates that are available, but the best thing is just to go through a, a lawyer. It's a very easy and simple process. And that is what I had done uh, for my mother, Rahimahullah, uh, as well. So contact a lawyer, but you can also use the free templates that are available. I know for the personal director, Alberta Health Services has one, inshallah. Sorry? There's one from Alberta Law School. Alberta Law School? Alberta Law Society. So Alberta Law Society also has a power of attorney, inshallah, that you can take a look at. Uh, but just keep in mind those templates may not necessarily be the best thing for you, depending on your situation, inshallah. Go ahead. Excellent. So the brother's question is, if a person converts to Islam and their family says that we don't want their Muslim name on this document, do, can they control that? Do they have their right? Islamically, they don't have that right. And even from a legal perspective, I'll let Faraz answer that question. Um, if a person converts to Islam, can their family dictate what name goes on their will or not? Uh, legally, no. I mean, if it's your will, you would put your name on it, but you would want to put your... I, to, to make it valid and simple, you would want to put your legal name. If you were born with a non-Muslim name and you've later converted and you've adopted a Muslim name, that's great. But for your will, you should put at some point, it should have your legal name identified in it. And then you can put an alias or also known as, or you can explain that you also have a Muslim name. But you want your full legal name as recognized by other government authorities. Otherwise, you may get you, you may run into problems with uh, Canada Revenue Agency or having it enforced. Where, where you know, with your bank, for example, if your bank doesn't know you by your Muslim name, then yeah. so you definitely want to have your proper full legal name in there. You can add the Muslim name as well, but other family members cannot dictate what you will and won't put into your will. That's entirely up to you again the only the only place where your family members can upset the apple cart of what you put in your will is if there's really an issue on dependent relief which again is your spouse 
children that are under 18, if they're over 18 and have some kind of mental or physical uh, issue that prevents them from being self-sufficient, or if they are over 18 but under 22 and in school. Other than that, uh, your family members can't really interfere with what will happen with your estate. Thank you so much. Next question. Yeah. When, uh, if both parents pass away, actually there was a section in the wills panel because of the confusion on the pages I didn't get to address. There's actually a section in that document. Uh, so you are meant to apply uh, appoint a guardian uh, for your children. So what we mentioned over here is someone that you, they have easy access to, have familiarity with. But the highlight I always give is that even after you pass away, you have a responsibility of your children getting Islamic tarbiyah. So what that translates as is sometimes your closest family members aren't the best people to take care of your children. What you want to do is leave them in the care of someone that's willing and accepting the responsibility and can also give them the Islamic upbringing that they deserve. No, this is inside the will over here. When you look at the section of guardianship, I'll go back to the exact page. I want to say it's page six, um, but this seems to be a no, the executor is not always the guardian. So if you look at executor and guardian from the bottom of page five, there's actually a section that it feels like it's missing over here on page six, at least in my copy. But there's a section for the guardian uh, that is meant to be appointed uh, over there, inshallah. Yeah. Six. Sister in the middle, go ahead. Excellent. So I'll answer the Islamic side and I'll let Faraz answer the other side. So in terms of distributing your wealth uh, while you're alive, it is permissible to do so, but it shouldn't be unjust, right? It's permissible to do so, but it shouldn't be uh, unjust. And then any wealth that is still remaining after you pass away has to be distributed according to the laws of Islam, right? So that those four categories. So that's what's meant to happen over there, even if it's a joint account. You approximate how much wealth belongs to each individual, and then based upon that, you distribute uh, that money, inshallah. Allah what was the qu I, I couldn't hear a lot of it. The, the question is about if a person distributes their wealth while they're alive, mm. but then they have a joint bank account after they pass away, do they still have to go through probate and you know the clearance of the accounts and all that stuff? Ah, uh, yes. So, I mean, on, in a legal basis, what you've done during your life, you've done during your life, that's not really an issue during your will. Um, whether or not you have a bank, so the bank account question you raise is, is interesting because there's two types of property ownership. One is tenants in common, one is joint tenants. So with joint tenants, when one person passes, the surviving uh, owner automatically receives the rest. But if it's tenants in common, your portion when you pass gets frozen and then it's subject to the division that you've put forward in your will, uh, provided it gets approved and there's no challenges to it and, and that sort of thing. So I mean, there, there's probably a circumstance somewhere where it becomes difficult. Like if, you, if a parent has two minor children and they've given everything in their life right before they pass to one and you know, then left a very small estate and then, then asked for that to be divided, I suppose then the other child, uh, likely through the public guardian or through their later guardian, and I, if one's appointed, could challenge that. I mean, we could. There's way. There's situations where that could become problematic, but um, just as far as the bank account would go, it, if it's tenants in common in a joint bank account, it's frozen. Joint tenants, it automatically goes to whoever's got it left. But what you've done with your estate during your life is is up to you at that time, really. If you, that, that website I have, there's an estate planning guide. So if you have bank accounts or any joint accounts, that includes investment accounts as well, uh, there's, a, there's a big no-no having a joint like, children with you on those accounts. 
it causes them tax problems, causes you tax problems as well. But if you go through that guide, there's a whole section on what Faraz is referring to, specifically laid out, and the pros and cons of doing that. It will answer most of your questions, that estate guide. Um, the brother in the middle who's asking the question on guardianship, I actually opened up the document that's on the ISC website. So if you look at the bottom of page three and the beginning of page four, that is where you nominate the guardians. So if you, that's the, the page that has the, the guardianship on it, inshallah. The questions from the brother's side? Who else has a question? Bismillah, go ahead. If, if a child or children get more from in the life of the grandparents, so do they qualify for the share in the estate? So you have the grandparent, you have the, the mother and father, and then you have the children. Mother and father have passed away? So. The father has passed away from the paternal side. Okay, so if they have children, then in that sort of situation, uh, the, grand, the, the parents will not inherit. The, the children will get the wealth divided amongst them, inshallah. Because the children will get priority over the parents. Sorry, so then you're asking if the grandparents passed away and their children are alive? So who's... Yeah. But their father passed away. Okay. Right? Yeah. Grandparents are okay. They have some property, right? Got you. So if the grandparents still being alive, their children will get priority over their grandchildren. Okay. So if all the wealth gets distributed according to the laws of Islam and it's all done with the children, then the grandchildren won't get any. But if there's certain situations where you only have daughters but you have one male grandson then that male grandson will still get a portion of it, right? So depending on the scenario, that's how it would play out. But generally speaking, the first generation blocks off generations lower than it. That's generally how it works. But yeah. what if the estate laws, you know, give them access uh, right to the property of the grandparents, the which Islamic law would not take precedence of the estate law? Then this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to fear him as much as possible. So as much as is possible to implement the directive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should do so. But if there's a limitation from a legal side where you're unable to implement it, then there's excuse and pardon at that side. But you still have to make the effort to make sure that the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are implemented. Allah uh, I'll add very briefly, that, that's a good point actually, because when I was talking about dependent relief and whether people can challenge if you've left enough for them, if a grandparent has stood in the place of a parent for a grandchild, that grandchild could then on that basis actually try to uh, make a claim that they, their grandparent needs to leave them adequate support. Uh, and then on a, on a legal basis, if you've not left a will, if the grandparent does not have a spouse and then they have children, and let's say they have three children, so two of those children are alive, one of those children is not alive, and the child who is not alive has a child of his own. The estate then falls from the, grand, uh, from the grandparent, we'll call it, to his children, but then when it gets to his deceased child section, that then falls down to his grandchild. And then if he has multiple grandchildren, then it gets divided equally amongst his grandchildren uh, for his share. So now that's not always going to be in line with what the way Sharia is intended. So provided that there's not an issue somewhere with the dependent relief issue, uh, then you can structure your will to generally... No, you, you can structure your will to match. I shouldn't even say generally. Provided dependent relief is managed out, then you can still ma you can still make it work based on what the the Sharia will say the percentages are. The only thing to be aware of there is when your composition changes, you may need to make updates. Questions from the sisters? Sister in the back, go ahead. Yeah. Excellent, great question. So the first question is with regards to uh, 
the CRA may take up to 30 to 50 percent of the inheritance before it reaches the kids. What in what scenario does that happen? Yeah, so this is a, a very, very common scenario for people that actually have wealth. So as you go through life, you accumulate wealth, you accumulate different types of wealth, right? So, so most commonly, you know, you have things such as RSP accounts, right? You have pension plans or locked in retirement accounts or locked in income funds. You may have secondary property, you may have rental property, you may have a business. What passes down to your beneficiaries completely tax-free without any issues or problems is your primary residence, a tax-free savings account. That is it. And then if you have some money in checking account, savings account, that's about it. But everything else after that, there's going to be tax consequences to it. So again, most people that have wealth will have accumulated uh, well, besides just the RSPs, so you know you have a non-registered portfolio that you contributed two hundred thousand dollars to, and now it's worth eight hundred thousand dollars. The way it works is that when the last person dies, literally a few minutes before their death, every single thing that they own is deemed disposed, sold at the highest tax bracket, not physically sold, but for tax purposes, is sold. So again, real life example, somebody bought a real estate for $400,000 rental, now it's worth $800,000. When they die, that's a $400,000 capital gain triggered right then and there. So there's gonna be tax on $200,000. If you have an RSP account for, pick a number, a million dollars, you die, that is a million dollars added to your income that day you died, that year. So you made a million dollar income there, you made a $200,000 capital gain there, then all of a sudden you had another like a business. I mean, people who are well, like they have businesses, right? A corporation, uh, that, that's deemed disposed as well. So, so, so the moment you die, a minute before you die, everything you have is sold. Depends on what kind of wealth you have, or how much of that you have, that there is and could be a very significant tax consequence to that. Does that make sense? Does that look good? To answer the question uh, about the mortgage, so when someone passes away and they have a mortgage, then the immediate payment that is due, that is what will be uh, deducted from their uh, will as a, a debt. And then the mortgage itself should be transferred, or if it's a joint owner, should automatically be transferred to the spouse or whoever the uh, joint owner is, and then gets transferred to their name, and therefore they have no more liability towards it. In the case that there is no joint ownership and they are the sole owner, then they have to go through that whole legal process and until the legal process of transfer takes place, all of the accumulated mortgage payments would have to be deducted from the estate. Now, the important disclaimer I will give uh, about taking conventional mortgages is that I personally believe that taking a conventional mortgage as a default ruling is not allowed, right? Try to save up for your money, pay it in cash, try to use other avenues like your RSPs, like the first time home buyer's plan, like you know, borrowing money from family and friends interest-free from your business interest-free, try to do it that way. If that's not an option, do your own due diligence, find a halal financing corporation and go through that to billahi ta'ala. The only thing I will mention is that there is flexibility in the sharia that based upon your circumstance and situation, a conventional mortgage may be allowed based upon the time and place, but that is not a decision we should take upon ourselves to make. This is something we should speak to a local imam and a local sheikh about and see if we are eligible for a concession to take a conventional mortgage. Wallahu ta'ala. Like, folks, I'm not going to take any more questions at this time because we won't be able to answer it before the Akama time and I don't want to delay the salah any further. With that being said though, um, are you going to be sticking around after salah? Can you stick around a bit for after salah? Both of these gentlemen will be here after salah to answer your questions in this very area. Open to both brothers and sisters and I myself will be available and also I'm accessible through email as well. You can email me inshallah. So we will have the adhan followed by the aqama thereafter. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallahum bihamdik. Ashadu la ilaha ilaha astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Just a quick uh, couple of announcements. Number one is that we have the event with Sheikh Ali Nasir and Sheikh Abdurrahman Khattab for new Muslims uh, and um, people interested in Islam. That's happening tomorrow. And then also next week there will be no halaqa. Next week there will be no halaqa inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan.